Feeling anxious about the climate crisis? Are you wondering who is really responsible for greenhouse gas emissions? Does individual responsibility matter? Then this episode is for you. Welcome to the Secret Life of Numbers podcast, the podcast where we dissect everyday numbers and statistics to find the stories behind them. Each episode, we take a number or statistic and break it down. We will tell you where it comes from and what it means for you. Along the way, hopefully we will inspire you to think about the numbers in your own life. I'm LaVanya, your data scientist on call. I'll be breaking down the numbers. I'm Lindsay, your data translator. For when LaVanya gets too technical on us, I'll be breaking down the rest. (laughs) All right, let's jump in. For those of you who have been listening to the entire sustainability series, we began by first talking about the zero in zero waste and what that really means. And then we moved on to talk about plastics and how much plastic actually gets recycled and what is the fate of the majority of the plastic that we use. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about a pretty ubiquitous number that floated around a little while ago. And that is that 100 companies are responsible for 70% of global CO2 emissions. So Lindsay, do you want to take it away? This number is one that I've heard a lot in passing. And I've also seen a lot recently on social media. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about this number is it's often used as a way to make people feel better about their own habits and choices and emissions and their own kind of carbon footprint because it really highlights how just a few, well, a hundred companies are really responsible for a huge amount of global emissions. But I wanted to know, is there more behind this number? I don't know if this is a good thing, but sometimes I feel like it like gives you permission to pollute because you know that your impact is so minimal when you look at this number, or at least you think your impact is minimal when you look at this number? I think so. And I think it also, it can either create a sense of comfort or it can create a sense of hopelessness of how are we ever going to tackle the climate crisis when we have these massive, massive companies who, quite frankly, are still making money <laughs> Yes, with their greenhouse gas emissions. How are we going to turn this around? How can we come up against this, you know, kind of Goliath as just a small group of Davids? Well, we're going to talk about the report that published this number first. But I wanted to begin with a definition of greenhouse gases, just so we all start out on the same page. That sounds like a good idea. (laughs) So this definition comes from Britannica. So a greenhouse gas is any gas that has the property of absorbing infrared radiation emitted from Earth's surface and re-radiating it back to Earth's surface, thus contributing to the greenhouse effect. Some heavy hitting greenhouse gases that I'm sure everyone's heard of are CO2, carbon dioxide. Um, methane, water vapor in some cases, Um, but these are the most important or the ones that you'll often hear about. Right, right. There's a few other too, Uh, nitric oxide. Fluorocarbons are also pretty, pretty bad. So I guess what it really comes down to is it absorbs heat, but then it also sends it back. Yeah, and then it, it essentially makes the planet a greenhouse, which is why we keep getting warmer. (laughs) Spicy. (laughs) (laughs) Something that I learned is that not all greenhouse gas emissions are the same. So we actually have different what they call scopes of greenhouse gas emissions. And it's really just kind of a way of categorizing emissions from a company or a country so that when companies or countries or 
institutions or whatever are planning to reduce their greenhouse gases or get a handle on it, they can either address like one of the scopes or they can address multiple scopes. And in some ways, it can be used to not really address a lot of emissions from a company if you choose to only focus on one scope, but your plan doesn't explicitly explain that there's a lot of other scopes. (laughs) I suppose like anything, you can focus on one scope and forget the others, or you can look at it holistically, or you can look at the scope that matters the most to you, or you think has the most impact. So, Or that's the easiest to do, and then you look really good as a company. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's just a lens in which to analyze your greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, it's just a way of kind of binning the different emissions. Yeah. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of go through these scopes. There's three. Mm -hmm. Scope one is direct emissions from really things that are within a company's organizational boundary. So things that the company directly owns and controls. So for example, business travel in a company car, fuel combustion for the company's furnace, Some other examples are generation of electricity, steam, or heat, and equipment that's owned or controlled by the company, emissions from company-owned or controlled refrigeration and air conditioning. So it's really like directly what is the company emitting? Yeah. So like what is within their immediate and direct scope? Yes. Then we also have scope two and scope three. And these scopes are both indirect emissions. Mm, Slippery. Yes. (laughs) So scope two can be classified as indirect emissions from the consumption of purchased electricity, steam, or heat. So it's not necessarily something that's controlled by the company, but it's indirectly being admitted as a result of actions of the company. Okay. And then lastly, we have scope three. So again, this is an indirect emission, um, and it can come from a variety of things. So there's upstream things. So before kind of, let's say, the company that we're looking at their scopes of emissions, you know, they manufacture a product. So there can be upstream scope three emissions. So that could be from the goods and services that they purchase, the waste generated in operations, the transport and distribution of the raw materials that they need. And then we can also have downstream activities. So scope three emissions is where we take into account the end of life treatment of a sold product or the use of a sold product, as well as processing of it, transportation to you know places of business, assets that are leased. So if it's a company that has a lot of brick and mortar stores. Mm -hmm. The emissions from those stores is counted under scope three. I'm going to take a guess to say that it's very difficult to measure scope three. Absolutely. I think any of them would be difficult, but because of how much is in scope three, because it's everything upstream to get that product there, The things that actually happen within the factory or whatever the business is, that's scope one. But then what happens afterwards is kind of a black box in a lot of cases. And I think that's one of the things that lends companies to maybe push more to address only scope one, because that's something in their immediate vicinity. There are a lot of like scope three factors to consider. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we've done definitions of greenhouse gases, we've talked a little bit about different scopes. Where did this number come from? So this number actually came from a report that was published in 2017. It was titled the Carbon Majors Database, CDP Carbon Majors Report 2017, 100 Fossil Fuel Producers and Nearly 1 Trillion Tons of Greenhouse Gas Emissions. They had some major conclusions in this report, and I should say as well that this is, it's a short report, only 16 pages, but it's incredibly dense, and there's a lot of information contained in here. But the big number that the media picked up was that 100 companies are responsible for 70% of global CO2 emissions. Yeah, it kind of went viral in a sense. Like, it got picked up, I think, by The Guardian and then just snowballed from there. Let's talk about how they came to this conclusion. This project that they did, it's quite unique because um, this is the first time really that I think we looked at greenhouse gas emissions from the perspective of who's producing them. Mm. The Carbon Majors Project, as it's called, they set out to trace back cumulative emissions 
from the highest emitting companies back to the 1850s. And their goal was to kind of like shine a lens on accountability. Yeah, because it's kind of like a monolith and you just see the raw numbers of these emissions. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, this report's kind of playing the blame game, but I think it's important that we know. Yeah, and I think one thing that perhaps those of you who are like familiar with the story of the climate crisis is that there is a lot of blaming, right? Like in the introduction to this report, they talk about what happened at the Copenhagen summit where like discussions kind of devolved into like developing versus developed, North versus South, historical emitters versus future emitters. And they just really wanted to categorize these are the emitters. (laughs) Yeah. And I guess, I mean, no one likes even, (laughs) no one likes being blamed for things. So I imagine that would be a delicate geopolitical situation to be in. The thing about the report, it's got the past perspective, then they have the current. Current for the report was 2015. uh, And then they look to the future as well. And they talk about like what needs to be done in order to like reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Foreshadowing to the IPCC report. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that's the other thing, right? This report was written in 2017, looking at data up to 2015. And the story that we have now is very different. So what did the report find? So the way they calculated the greenhouse gas emissions is they really wanted to keep transparency at the core of their approach. And that really relies on company reported activity data and also follows a simple reproducible methodology for estimating um, emissions. So this comes directly from their report where they talk about the approach. And it says, where possible, scope one emissions from upstream activities are sourced from company responses to the CDP climate change information request. Scope 1 emissions of non-responders and of all Scope 3 emissions are estimated. The estimation method follows the IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories. I know we're going to talk about the IPCC a little bit later. It's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Thank you. And that formula that they're talking about that is that is set out by the IPCC is that products that are produced have an emissions factor. So you would take the product, you would multiply it by its emissions factor, and you would sum up all of the products and all of the emissions. So what what is the product? Is that just like how many are produced? Yeah. So you could think about it as like barrels of oil, for example. Right. So the number of barrels of oil would be the product, and then the emissions associated with each barrel would be the emissions factor. Mm -hmm. You multiply it, and then you sum for all of the products that a company has, and then you get their emissions. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Like maybe they're also producing coal, for example. Right. And then you have your oil calculation, you have your coal calculation, Mm -hmm. and you get there. So I guess you're wondering where this 100 companies accounts for 70% of emissions like stat comes from. I am wondering. I'm very curious. I would recommend to our listeners that you do take a chance to read this report because it's, it's not long. It's only 16 pages and it's got a lot of good information in here. And even though it's, I mean, it is old compared to the information we have about the climate crisis now, but the story that it tells is still quite powerful, I think. But where that number comes from is in that analysis that the Carbon Majors Project did, and they call it past accountability, because remember, they looked all the way from the 1850s to 2015. Right. And they concluded that over half of global industrial emissions since human-induced climate change was officially recognized can be traced to just 25 corporate and state-producing entities. And then they further go on to say and this is like a direct quotation from their report, is that the distribution of emissions is concentrated. 25 corporate and state producing entities account for 51% of global industrial greenhouse gas emissions, and all 100 producers account for 71% of global industrial greenhouse gas emissions. So that's where we get our 100 producers. They took the top 100, I guess, from their analysis. Mm Mm-hmm. If we want to 
further break it down, the report says that the highest emitting companies since 1988 that are investor-owned include ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, Chevron, Peabody, Total, and BHP Billiton. Mm-hmm. Key state-owned companies include Saudi Aramco, Gazprom, National Iranian Oil, Coal India, Pemex, and CNPC, which is PetroChina. So I guess coal emissions from China are represented by the state in which key state-owned producers include Xuanhan Group, Dayton Coal Mine Group, and China National Coal Group. So those are some of the heavy emitting companies. I think what's interesting, though, is like some of these are really like recognizable companies like Shell and Chevron. And like we know those here in Canada, they're like, you know, drive past one every day. But a lot of these companies are also. It's like a state, right? Yeah, Yeah, it's a state, right? Because not every country handles their energy the same way when you're looking at this kind of mammoth of these hundred companies, it's not as simple as like, here's a hundred investor owned companies that we're also talking about countries really. Yeah. Which is kind of misleading in that phrase, right? Cause it says a hundred companies. We don't necessarily think about countries and states when we think about companies. So I guess that's how we got to a hundred companies. That's how we got to a hundred companies. Yes. 100 companies contributing to 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. Does this make you anxious at all, Lindsay? I'm just curious. (laughs) I ask because it makes me anxious. (laughs) I think the eco-anxiety is real. I don't know if it's just... With this, like this phrase doesn't get me as much anymore because I've heard it so much that I'm not, I don't have as much shock factor with it. I think what really hit me hard is the new IPCC report. Yes, that just came out. But we're going to get to that a little bit later because one of the things that I think is important to talk about when we mention the 100 companies is that out of the top 10, Eight of them are government entities, right? So there's only two privately owned companies like Exxon and Shell. And so it really becomes this massive, massive problem. In reading the report more and in doing more reading around this, I don't think this stat is really an argument against individual responsibility because all of these companies are producing things that will make them money, which means that people are buying it. And sometimes, like, we only have so many choices. For example, like, if you live in an apartment building where there's no charging stations for an electric car, it doesn't make it practical to get an electric car. Like, we can only operate a lot of times within the systems that we're given. And those systems are very, like, reliant on fossil fuels. But at the same time, this statistic is, it's really about consumption, not necessarily just production by these companies. Like if you think about production, you must also think about who consumes it. So they only produce what we want, like and what we're using. So in a sense, you're right. It's not, it doesn't necessarily take away our individual responsibility because we are consuming their products. Yeah. It's all supply and demand. Like if no one wanted to buy fossil fuels, there wouldn't be money in it. Yeah. I mean, also, it, it's tough, like, as you're saying, because like, there aren't very many options available to us as consumers. Like, when you think about your car, up until recently, an electric car wasn't an option for many people. And, like, you had to, like, they were a little bit more expensive or, like, a lot more expensive than your your gas-powered engine or your combustion engine. I would say people in our demographic are really quite in a lot of ways, receptive to this. And it's something that we've kind of grown up with the climate crisis being talked about as a crisis. But if you think about it, like if I think about people my age, if they're going to go out and buy a car, a lot of people are just starting out. Maybe what this report is illustrating is it's not just the hundred companies. It's like 
it doesn't allow us just because they're producing the emissions doesn't mean we don't have responsibility because we consume the products. So we need to perhaps demand that there are products produced that emit less. Or maybe it also says that like we're all in this together, not just the companies, but also the consumers. I think so. I think no one is absolved from the climate crisis. We all have a role to play. We've all played a role coming to the point where we're at now. And I think we're really at this pivotal point where we decide where do we go from here. I agree. So welcome back, everybody. Uh, before the break, we talked about where this um, this number of 100 companies being responsible for 70% of global ga- greenhouse gas emissions come from and the report that came to that conclusion. Um, but now we kind of want to talk about like what our situation is now, because as we mentioned, that report was published in 2017 and contained data from the 1980s to 2015. But right now we have a very different story, or maybe not a different story, but we have more data. And there was another report recently published by the IPCC. Yeah, so we're recording this episode in August 2021. And we were actually going to record it a week or two earlier than when we are now. But just as we were about to sit down and record, the new Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, Climate Change 2021 report was released, or at least the first part of it. And we... We took a moment. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We felt a bit of anxiety about the report. I think it's a lot to take in because this story isn't a radical 180 from what we already knew, but to see it in such strong terms. Stark language as well, I felt. Yeah, it's very devoid from emotion, but the emotion you feel reading it is, oh no. Yeah, like this is the sixth IPCC report, if I'm not mistaken. So I read through the summary for policymakers, and I pulled quite a few quotes from it that I wanted to share, and we can kind of discuss what has come out now. So one of the first kind of direct quotes that I have from the report is that it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and biosphere have occurred. Human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in the last 2,000 years. I think before we were kind of debating, we're like, yes, climate change is happening, but is it human caused? And I think the report is like saying, like, no bones about it. It's caused by humans. And I think they even go so far as to simulate it. Yeah, so they actually have a figure here that kind of stayed with me. This is, I guess, figure SPM1, History of Global Temperature Change and Causes of Recent Warming. Oh, is this the one where they simulate what what temperature fluctuations would be without human influence and then they show what's happening? Yeah. Yeah. So they simulate natural only, which is like solar and volcanic. This is like basically a flat line. And then they showed the observed warming, which is simulated human and natural. And the observed is like an exponential increase starting in like the 1850s. That figure hit hard. It's one of the first ones in the report. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, I think the word that they use is like very strong. It's unequivocal that it's human influence. So we'll go on. I have a few more that I wanted to pull out. There's a lot of different things covered by the report. So some of it is about like greenhouse gases and CO2. Some of it's about, you know, rising ocean temperatures, sea level rise, acidification of the ocean. Like there's so many facets. And I think one thing that's really important to understand about climate change and the climate crisis that we're in is that nothing happens in a vacuum, right? Yes. So mm-hmm. a good example of this is in Canada, and specifically, especially in British Columbia, the 
change in temperature that we're seeing, so, you know, an earlier spring, a later fall, has allowed pine beetles to have two reproductive cycles during the summer. Hmm. And if you know anything about pine beetles, you know that they ravish forests and essentially create perfectly dry kindling. Yeah, that like is matchsticks. The trees become standing matchsticks. <laughs> absolutely. And hmm. Yeah, there's so many things going on in the world right now, but one of them is that a lot of the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia is on fire. Yes. And like these things are all connected, right? So I'm not saying it's exactly the pine beetles' fault that we're in this smoky mess, but it's kind of an example of how one small thing of temperature can explain, at least in part, more extreme events that we're seeing. Mm. I recently read All We Can Save, which I would recommend our listeners read, but it's a collection of essays about the climate crisis. And one of the quotations that kind of stuck with me from those essays was that everything is connected and everything is complicated. (laughs) (laughs) That's perfect. That's the perfect quote. (laughs) And I feel like when I read the IPCC report, that's what it was also communicating, but in scientific language. (laughs) I think it's something worth reading. And Mm -hmm. if you have to read it a few times, if you have to kind of look at summaries that other people have made to get the gist, if you have to sit with it for a long time, I think it really is worth it because it really lays out what is happening in our planet. And we can relate that to so many of the more extreme events that we're seeing, whether it's fires or more tropical storms or flooding in areas that have not flooded for hundreds of years. It really helps provide that scientific basis for what we're observing. I agree. Since we've kind of been talking about greenhouse gas emissions, I pulled a few quotes that talk about exactly that. In 2019, atmospheric CO2 concentrations were higher than at any time in the last two million years. Every statement that they make, they in brackets, they say like the confidence that they have in it. So this was a high confidence statement. And they go on to say, and concentrations of methane and nitric oxide were higher than at any time in the last 800,000 years. It's a very high confidence statement. Since 1750, increases in carbon dioxide, 47%, and methane, 156%, concentrations far exceed and increases in nitric oxide, 23%, are similar to the natural multi-millennial changes between glacial and interglacial periods over the last 800,000 years. And that's, again, very high confidence. So what that's saying is within the span of less than 300 years, we're seeing increases in potent greenhouse gases, so carbon dioxide, methane, nitric oxide, that are very similar to the change that we'd be seeing over millennia, right? Because The reality is that the Earth, like over time, if you look back in history, it's gone through periods of cooling and warming and glacial periods and interglacial periods. And the problem isn't so much what we're seeing. It's it's the rate that we're seeing it at. Like the rate is unprecedented. That's why I think when you listen to like weather reports now, it's always this is the highest recorded temperature in like 20 years, like because like the rate at which the temperatures are increasing is so much faster than we expected or so much faster than we've seen before. Totally. And it's funny. I saw this article from the Beaverton. I don't know how to explain the Beaverton. It's like none of the things are true. It's kind of a satire. Mm, Like the onion. (laughs) Yeah, but it like pokes. There's always a hint of truth behind it. And Mm. one of the things that the article said was it was like oh instead of reporting the weather they just now say like what records were broken (laughs) (laughs) yeah because every year it's like we've never seen this before it's never been this bad yeah sometimes it does it does feel like that like every year breaks some record like every year like the storms are more violent they're the fires are are larger i mean like this is the climate crisis it's it's a crisis. So there's there's a lot more in the report about kind of what's going on with these greenhouse gases, what's going on with the ocean, with our air. But kind of moving toward where do we go from here? 
here's another direct quote, from a physical science perspective, limiting human-induced global warming to a specific level requires limiting cumulative CO2 emissions, reaching at least net zero CO2 emissions, along with strong reductions in other greenhouse gas emissions. Strong, rapid, and sustained reductions in methane emissions would also limit the warming effect resulting from a declining aerosol pollution and would improve air quality. So basically, they're saying that like we have to get to net zero emissions and reduce greenhouse gases as much as possible. Yeah. The gist of it is that like we need to turn this ship around like yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) They say it in much more eloquent terms. Yeah. And they also do some predicting in that report, if I'm not mistaken, like what would happen if we increase by like 1.7 degrees? What would happen if we increase by 2.5, I think? Yeah, there's some great figures and they go through different scenarios of, you know, there's the middle scenario of we stay the course that we're going. There's, I think, two other scenarios that are worse than that. There's two that are a bit better. And it goes through like what we'd see with precipitation, what we would see with temperatures. It's a really good and sobering report to look at because it really makes you question, like, what kind of world do I want to live in for the rest of my life? And what kind of world do I want to leave for the generations to come? I think coupled with the Carbon Majors report, you see a picture evolve, but I think you can't help but ask yourself, what can I do now? What are the things that I can change? And I think that's something that you have to kind of ask and audit in your own life. We kind of talked about this with the zero waste episode. But I think one of the things that we see from the IPCC report is that like swapping your toothbrush will not save us. Like we have to Mm -hmm. do more, right? And we really have to overhaul like entire systems of energy consumption. We need to get off of fossil fuels. Yeah, I think that's the main takeaway, right, from the IPCC report is that we, we need to get off of fossil fuels. Like the dinosaurs need to stay in the ground. (laughs) Exactly. And I think for people asking those questions of how do we go about this? How do we actually make changes? What can we still save? Mm -hmm. I would again direct them to the podcast, How to Save a Planet, because they really lay out kind of higher level things that you can do that have an impact. Yeah, I think they talk about expanding your sphere. And they really have um, like some really good information about how you can communicate to your elected officials that these things matter to you. Yeah. So we would encourage all of our listeners to check out their podcast. So, Lindsay, do you know what time it is? I think I do. Science seed. Yeah. So it's time for our science seed. So each episode, we like to give our listeners something to think about. A science nugget if you will, to help you think more critically about the numbers and statistics you hear every day. So, Lindsay, do you want to take it away for this week? Yeah, today we're going to take a little bit of a page out of How to Save a Planet's Flow um, and leave our listeners with a bit of a call to action. So we want to challenge all of our listeners to check out the IPCC report for themselves. Also, communicate to your elected officials that these things matter to you. Um, So in Canada, we have members of parliament or MPs, so you can write letters, you can call them. I understand that it seems daunting and it seems scary, but these are people that we elect and they do in fact want to hear from you. And one of the things that was a takeaway from an episode of How to Save a Planet, which had a very similar call to action, is that it actually doesn't take that many people calling and writing for it to possibly affect change. Thanks for listening, everyone. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find the references we use for this episode in our show notes. A special thank you to Julian Bertino, who does our sound editing and music. Have an idea of what number we should cover next? Want to learn more about what we've talked about today? Follow us on Instagram at The Secret Life of Numbers. We'll catch you next time on The Secret Life of Numbers, where the numbers can run, but they can't hide. Thank you.